Jesus. Amen. Now, Jesus has many titles. Savior, Lord, Redeemer, Lamb of God. And many of these names come straight from Scripture. They're names that Scripture gives to us. Other names we give and apply to Jesus because they fit. They're scriptural. For example, Redeemer with a capital R. Jesus is never called the Redeemer with a capital R. But we read throughout Scripture that He is the Redeemer. So it's an appropriate title. Well, here's another title for Jesus that you may not have heard of before. Jesus is the Rest Giver with a capital R. Rest Giver. This isn't a title that appears directly in Scripture, but we read in the Bible about Jesus who gives us rest. And in our Gospel lesson tonight, we read just that. He invites the weary, the heavy laden, so that He might give them rest. Soul rest. Spirit rest. Jesus is the rest giver. And let's take a look a little bit more at our gospel lesson and learn more about Jesus, our rest giver. If you're anything like me, this is good news. Because at the end of a long week, or at the end of a long day, I need rest. We all need rest. You know, it's interesting that children can understand often better than adults the wonderful news that Jesus is the rest giver. And we see Jesus explaining this in our Gospel text. What's not in the Gospel text tonight is He chides the cities where He did many miracles and preached the Gospel, but the people didn't listen to Him. At least the response was very low. And He chides them and He says, If I had done the same things that I did for you to Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented. And then begins our Gospel lesson, and he says at the beginning of our Gospel lesson, Praise be to God, because He has revealed these things to children, and hidden them from the wise. And it's not that Jesus is saying that adults can't believe, but He's saying oftentimes children seem to believe easier than adults. In other Gospels, readings, we see Jesus saying we need to become like children and accept what he has, he has to offer like children. I'll always remember a neighbor boy that my wife and I had when we were first married. And we were living in Southern California in Metro Los Angeles. And we lived in a Spanish sort of villa apartment complex where it had 40 units on two levels and it was in the shape of a square with a courtyard in the middle. It sounds romantic, but it wasn't really. You could hear nearly everything that your neighbors were doing. And uh, there was one especially dysfunctional family, you could say we're all dysfunctional, but there was one especially dysfunctional family that lived across from us, a, a mother, her teenage daughter, and then two young children, around six years old. And the screaming, and the yelling, and the threats, all at the top of their lungs, they did it all the time. And one day I was chatting with one of the, one of the boys, and I thought I'd try out my new, newly learned evangelism skills on this young boy. And uh, so we're chatting, and I finally get around to telling him about Jesus. And when I did, the boy's face got bright with a look of joy and peace. And he says, yeah, I know Jesus. I learned about him at Sunday school. He died on the cross for my sins. And my jaw dropped to the ground. And I couldn't believe how simple and beautiful this young boy's faith was. A boy that I would never have guessed God had given the gift of repentance and faith to. A boy that God had given soul rest to. 
Friends, we don't need seminary, we don't need college, we don't need any formal education to have a rich faith and to understand how Jesus is the rest giver, the one who gives us true rest, a rest that is so powerful that death never be feared because we have eternal life in Christ. Jesus is the rest giver. Indeed, He is. He says that in our text tonight. He says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus can offer true rest, soul rest, spirit rest, precisely because He's the Savior. He's the one who filled the righteous demands of the law for us, demands that we never seem to be able to get just right. Not only that, Jesus died on the cross for our sins and took the punishment that the law demands for our sins. Jesus did all this that we might have peace with God and eternal life. Jesus did all this that we might have rest and peace. Jesus is the rest giver. Now, I'd like to get into a little bit of uh, fancy theology, if you will. You can hearken back if you went to, uh, to Lutheran school. Uh, to understand Jesus as the rest giver, one must understand law and gospel. That is, one cannot grasp the rest, the sweet gospel rest that Jesus offers. Thus, one understands a little bit about the demands of the law. And one way to remember the difference between the law and the gospel is through the acronym SOS. SOS. The law, such as we see in the Ten Commandments, SOS, shows our sin. The gospel, on the other hand, SOS, shows our Savior. So, for example, the law that we see in the Ten Commandments shows our sin. When we read the Ten Commandments, or we think about them, we recite them, and if we're honest, we'll realize that we're sinners. Sinners that deserve eternal punishment. That's the law doing its work. The Gospel, on the other hand, are those stories, statements, teachings, Verses that show our Savior. In other words, they show us and point us to Jesus who lived the Ten Commandments perfectly for us. And who died on the cross for our sins so that we might have the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, and rest for our souls. And we need both. We need the law and we need the gospel. If we have just the law, we despair. If we have just the gospel, live immoral lives. You need both. Without understanding a little bit about law and gospel, one cannot understand Jesus as rest giver. If I probed that boy that I know knew in L.A., he would have had a rudimentary understanding of law and gospel. But we understand the law and how daily our sins condemn us. Sins like sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies. And Paul could have made the list even longer. And we have to admit that uh, we're guilty of those, not in deed, and we are guilty of them in thought. 